The village of Polstead, located on the northern slopes of the River Box, is a typical charming quaint English village where the village pub, the Cock, dates back to the 17th century. It has a long history, dating back to ancient times, and evidence of Roman occupation has been found in the form of discovered coins. The village covers a reasonably large area and the population continues to steadily increase. But back in 1828, the Sunday Times, dated the 27th of April 1828, mentions the village as being an obscure one and contains only around 20 to 30 houses. It continued, The residence of the prisoner's mother, Mrs Corder, is perhaps the best building in the place. It's a neat, moderately sized, whitewashed building with a door in the centre and stands about midway on the hill, leading from Stoke onto the Green, where the village public house called The Cock is situated. The barn where the body was deposited, and where it is in the opinion the murder was committed, lies about half a mile to the left of the village. Apart from the two small cottages, one being the Martins, there are no buildings for a quarter of a mile around. Maria Martin's family lived in a small thatched cottage on the road that led to the Red Barn. Her father, Thomas Martin, a mole catcher, and his second wife, Anne, had three children. He had three other grown children by his first wife, Grace. One being Maria, who was ten when her mother passed, the other being a male and a female, who Maria helped raise. Because of her exemplary management of the home and family, the community praised her highly. Thomas Martin was a humble man, honest and hard-working, respected by the small community. Maria Martin, the victim of this crime, was born in July 1801 and raised by her father in Polstead. Despite her humble background, Maria was an intelligent girl who, from her young age, learned as much as she could about the world around her. It was widely thought that if she had been able to have a proper education, she would have become an accomplished young woman. She possessed not only ordinary personal qualities, but also a beautiful face and attractive figure. It is hardly surprising that men were captivated by her. From the age of 18, Maria had been seduced by the attentions of the men in the village. Thomas Corder had taken a liking to the pretty Maria and often visited her at the cottage. The son of a wealthy farmer and seen as a catch for a woman, Maria was drawn in by his promises of a better future. Maria, despite her intelligence, was naive when it came to matters of love and relationships. She began a clandestine affair with Thomas, which resulted in her becoming pregnant. Sadly, Thomas did not reciprocate Maria's love and ceased all contact with her once the pregnancy was discovered. Maria had a profound love for her child, but tragically the baby passed away shortly after birth. Sometime later, Maria met another man who was by all accounts a wealthy man. I don't seem to be able to find much about this man, but he apparently courted her. They got on well, she became pregnant with her second child, Thomas Henry, and that would seem to be that. The man paid towards the child's upbringing every month and was to make sure he had an education when he was old enough. It wasn't known just when William Corder became involved with Maria, but whenever it was, a relationship was built on promises. Corder gave many promises to Maria that he would marry her. She became besotted with the young man, who it would seem was a bit of a rogue. Maria became pregnant again with her third child, William's child. Even though she and her father wanted to know when he would do the honourable thing and marry Maria, he always managed to find an excuse to postpone, but never denied his promise of marriage, as was witnessed by many others. Maria, for some reason, wasn't in the, her family home when she gave birth. She was staying somewhere in Sudbury. Then something strange occurred after the birth. She returned home with the child and the baby gradually became sick. All those who were present around the child declared the decline in the child's health was due to natural causes. But was it? 
It has long been thought that the child's passing was due to Corda. Unwilling to bear the financial burden of raising a child, resorted to underhand means to make the child sick. And Maria harboured her own suspicions regarding the child's illness. When the child passed, William Corder and Maria took the child's body in a box, William stating that he was going to have the child interred at Sudbury. It wasn't until after Maria's passing that they discovered the child had not been buried in any known location that they knew. Despite their efforts, they were unable to locate the child's body. The only conclusion they could reach was that the child hadn't had a Christian burial, but no further inquiry was made into the child's whereabouts. At the trial, Corder claimed he and Maria had buried the child in a field. Arguments between the couple were witnessed. On one occasion, Corder clandestinely took a five-pound note from a letter intended for Maria and her child. An argument erupted when she uncovered William's action. In an attempt to salvage the situation, he made a vow to Maria that if she kept his transgression a secret, she and her child would be perpetually provided for and would lack for nothing. William Corder was born in 1803 to John and Mary Corder. John Corder had lived in Polstead all his life and farmed 300 acres of land. The couple had eight children but lost two in infancy. On his death in 1825, he was survived by his widow and six grown children, four sons and two daughters. By 1828, only one of his sons was left, and that one son would be sent to the gallows for the taking of Maria's life. William was a well-educated child and indulged by his parents. Even at an early age he wasn't well liked amongst his peers as he had the reputation of being a thief and a liar who was sly and cunning which resulted in him earning the nickname Foxy. His parents despaired to the point of sending him to work on board a ship but because he had an eye defect he was turned away. Around this time he befriended a man nicknamed Beauty Smith, a notorious thief who had been transported twice because of his stealing pigs. He had also spent some time in prison. Corder and Smith would often team up to steal livestock. Smith would later be tried, convicted and transported for life. While Smith was in Chelmsford jail, he spoke derogatory of Corder, claiming the man would one day be hanged. When Corder was apprehended, a letter was sent to the place where Smith had been sent to inquire if he knew anything about Maria's passing. As he had told people, Corder would one day be hanged. Smith's response was that he knew nothing of the crime, but he knew Corder was a wrongdoer and hanging would possibly be the result of his ways one day. In May 1827, not long after the child's death, Corder visited the home of the Martins and indicated to Maria her father and stepmother, his readiness for the ceremony to take place. He mentioned that he had made a decision in order to save time and ensure privacy, instead of announcing the marriage through bans, he opted to obtain a marriage licence. On Friday the 18th of May 1827, he appeared at the Martins' cottage during the day and, according to Anne Martin, told Maria that they must leave at once as he had heard that the local constable had obtained a warrant to prosecute her for having children at a wedlock. It would be discovered that no warrant had been obtained. A shocked and distressed Maria was worried that if she left in the day she would be seen but Corder told her she should dress in men's clothes so she wouldn't be recognised. Corder told her she could change her clothes in the red barn on his property before leaving for Ipswich and he would meet her there. Corder left the Martins' cottage and Maria followed a little while later, making her way to the red barn on Barnfield Hill. Maria wasn't seen alive again. After about a day, Corder returned to Polstead without Maria. No alarm bells rang as everyone presumed she'd been set up in a house somewhere. Two weeks passed before her stepmother finally confronted Corder and asked about her well-being. 
He assured her that she was safe and sound, adding that he had kept her at a distance to avoid his friends finding out about their marriage and objecting to it. The Martins were not happy. They knew their daughter would write, giving them details of how she was and to inquire after her child and the family. Something wasn't right, so they pushed Corder for more information. He tried to assure them Maria was well and would write to them soon. By September, after making sure the red barn had been filled with as much stock as he could, mostly hay, Corder suddenly left Polstead telling everyone that he was sick and would possibly go abroad to help with his illness. He left with about £400 on his person. It wasn't long after he left that letters began showing up at the Martins, informing them that he and Maria were happily married and living on the Isle of Wight. And yet, on further investigation, his letters always bore the London postmark. He also gave various excuses for Maria's lack of communication with her family, stating she was unwell and she had hurt her hand or the letter must have been lost. Back in Polstead, Corder's mother was left with the impression her son had placed the unfortunate Maria in a home somewhere and kept her as his mistress. The Martins were growing more and more suspicious of Corder's excuses as to why they hadn't heard from Maria. What had happened to Maria? The extraordinary circumstances that revealed the death and place of Maria's burial ground go something like this. In the month of March 1828, Mrs Martin dreamed on three successive nights that her daughter's life had been taken and buried in the red barn. Terrified at the repetition of the vision, she felt justified by her already growing suspicion that something terrible had happened to her daughter. So strong were her feelings and so convinced was she of the truth of her dreams that on Saturday the 19th of April, she persuaded her husband to apply for permission to examine the red barn with the professed object of looking for her daughter's clothes. By now, most of the grain that was in the barn had almost gone. So after obtaining permission, Mr. Martin and Mrs. Corder's bailiff proceeded to the place pointed out by his wife in her dream as the place in which her daughter's remains were deposited. And there, after digging, he turned up a piece of the shawl which he knew his daughter had worn at the time of her leaving the house. Alarmed at the discovery, he continued to dig and when he had dug to the depth of about 18 inches with his rake, he dragged out a part of a human body. Horror-struck, he staggered from the spot, but subsequent examination proved that his suspicions were well-founded and that it was indeed his daughter. The place where her remains lay were in the exact spot his wife had dreamt of. The body was in an advanced state of decomposition, but the dress, which was perfect, and the teeth of the deceased gave sufficient proof of her identity. The coroner was informed, so an inquest could be held. Before the inquest, an examination had been performed by Mr John Lorden, a surgeon, who determined that Maria's death was a violent one. He said that there was a visible appearance of blood on the face and on the clothes of the deceased and also on a handkerchief which was around the neck. That the handkerchief appeared to have been tied extremely tight and beneath the folds a wound was visible in the throat which had evidently been inflicted by some sharp instrument. There was also a wound in the orbit of the right eye and it seemed as if something had been thrust in which had fractured the small bones and penetrated the brain. In conclusion, Maria had been stabbed with a sharp object, most likely a sword that Corder owned, her neck had been sliced and she was shot in the head. As soon as the body had been discovered, Corder was the only suspect. The information was sent to London, as that was where the last letter had been posted from. Mr James Lee, an officer of the Lambeth station, was sent out to locate Corder's whereabouts. With very little to go on, he went from place to place under cover. 
questioning people along the way. It took him some time, but he eventually found William Corder living in Grove House, Ealing Lane, with his new wife. William Corder had met his wife, Miss Moore, after he had advertised for a wife in the newspapers. They were married within a few days of meeting, much to the disgust of Miss Moore's brother. The new Mrs Corder opened a school for young ladies at the Grove House premises and it would seem she was besotted with her new husband. Corder hid himself away and was really seen outside. Once Corder had been arrested, his wife refused to believe the charges until all the facts came out and she couldn't deny it any longer. When questioned, Corder denied knowing anyone by the name of Maria Martin. But when the premises were searched, a velvet bag was discovered that was identified as Maria's by her father. Some other items, including some pistols and a dagger, were also retrieved and a passport suggesting Corder was intending to flee. Corder was taken in and returned to Suffolk to stand trial. On the 7th of August 1828, the trial started at the Shire Hall, Bury St Edmunds, with a packed courtroom, with many other onlookers waiting outside. The judge, Chief Baron Alexander, resided. The prisoner was asked how he wanted to plead, and Corder replied, Not guilty, my lord. William Corder made his statement claiming Maria had taken her own life after they had argued and when he started to leave the barn in a temper, he heard a loud bang. He claimed that he rushed back to find Maria lying on the ground. To his horror, he saw that she had used his weapon. He believed she must have taken them from his room and concealed them in her bag when she secretly stayed with him after the child was buried. He claimed his quandary was how this would look. He was alone in the barn with the dead woman, and it was his weapon that had been used. What should he do? He went on. After he had regained some sort of composure, he claimed if he had gone for help now, they would be suspicious of why he'd taken so long to get help. Concealment was, he claimed, his only way out of the situation. He stressed he wasn't thinking straight due to what had happened. He vehemently denied stabbing her, claiming the prosecution had only come to that conclusion when a dagger had been found on him. He also claimed that if he had been planning to commit this crime, why would he let anyone know that he would be in the red barn with Maria, as both her mother and father knew? He also claimed if he had been responsible, he would surely have run away, but he had stayed with his mother for months afterwards, only leaving when his health started to decline. He eventually rested his case, hoping the outcome would not be death. The defence questioned their witnesses, but they were mostly people who knew Corder, and their testimony tended to be more along the lines of character witnesses. After his lordship had summed up the case, stating that the prisoner was there on the charge of taking Maria's life first by using a pistol, then using a sharp weapon on her before using the handkerchief to tie around her neck. He stated that no matter what they had heard outside of the court, the jury must only go by what they had heard in the court and stick to the evidence that had been presented to them. He asked the jury to consider the fact that Mrs Martin had told the court that Cordera specifically lied to Maria about the charge against her having illegitimate children. It showed he wanted her away from the home and that Maria's mother had stated she had been in a low mood since returning home after the child had passed, and that it had been claimed the prisoner had been seen cleaning the pistols at his home just before the taking of Maria's life. Then the officer who found Corder in London, Mr Lee, stated that Corder had denied on more than one occasion of even knowing Maria Martin. Then the statement of the surgeon, Mr Lawton, and after his testimony, the possibility of Maria taking her own life in the manner claimed by Corder looked unlikely. The jury went out. After about 35 minutes, the jury returned with their verdict. They found Corder guilty of taking the life of Maria Martin. 
Corder collapsed in tears on hearing of his fate to be hanged on the next Monday, the 11th of August. During his time waiting to be hanged, his wife visited him. Mrs Corder declared her love for him and her belief in what he'd said and wished for him to make his peace with God. Before Corder went to the gallows, the governor of the prison, Mr Orridge, heard and wrote his confession. Corder's Confession I acknowledge being guilty of the death of poor Maria Martin by shooting her with a pistol. The particulars are as follows. When we left her father's house, we began quarrelling about the burial of the child. She, apprehending that the place wherein it was deposited, would be found out. The quarrel continued for about three quarters of an hour, upon this and other subjects. A scuffle ensued, and during the scuffle, and at the time I think she had hold of me, I took the pistol from the side pocket of my velveteen jacket and fired. She fell and died in an instant. I never saw even a struggle. I was overwhelmed with agitation and dismay. The body fell near the front doors on the floor of the barn. A vast quantity of blood issued from the wound and ran onto the floor and through the crevices. Having determined to bury the body in the barn about two hours after she was dead, I went and borrowed the spade of Mrs Stowe. But before I went there, I dragged the body from the barn into the chafe house and locked her up. I returned again to the barn and began to dig the hole. But the spade being a bad one and the earth firm and hard, I was obliged to go home for a pickaxe and a better spade with which I dug the hole and then buried the body. I think I dragged the body by the handkerchief that was tied around her neck. It was dark when I finished covering up the body. I went the next day and washed the blood from off the barn floor. I declared to Almighty God I had no sharp instrument about me and that no other wound but the one made by the pistol was inflicted by me. I have been guilty of great idleness and at times led a dissolute life, but I hope through the mercy of God to be forgiven. W. Corder When Corder stood between the executioner, Mr. Ketch, and the noose, his head covered with the black cap, he declared to all, I am guilty, my sentence is just, I deserve my fate, and may God have mercy upon me. Mr. Ketch then descended the stairs and cut the rope. Corder fell to his demise. Ketch then held the prisoner's waist to prevent a prolonged death. Until Corder's last breath was gone. A door was opened for the public to see the remains. It was said thousands of people passed by Corder's body and at 6pm the doors were closed. When Corder's body was removed, he was first checked by the surgeons and then sent for medical research. Medical students could only practice on cadavers from executed criminals back then, and his body was dissected and practiced on in front of medical students and surgeons. Corder's skin was tanned by the surgeon, George Creed, and used to bind an account of the murder. He also kept and preserved Corder's scalp. This case had all the elements. The wicked squire and the poor girl, the iconic murder scene, the supernatural element of the stepmother's prophetic dreams, the detective work by Ayers and Lee, and Corder's new life which was the result of a Lonely Hearts advertisement. Not to mention the gruesome facts after death. The sensationalism from this case was incredible. The newspapers of the time made a fortune. Plays and songs have been made and best-selling books written and it continues to this day to attract attention. Pieces of the rope which was used to hang Corder sold for a guinea each. Corder's scalp with an ear still attached that was removed by George Creed was displayed in a shop in Oxford Street. A lock of Maria's hair sold for two guineas. Polstead became a tourist venue with visitors travelling from far afield. 
It was estimated by a journalist at the time that over 200,000 people visited Polstead in 1828 alone. The red barn was stripped down with people taking souvenirs. The wood panels were taken and made into toothpicks. This continued until the barn burnt down in 1842. The Martins' cottage was constantly surrounded by onlookers wanting to see the place where Maria lived and the mother who had had those incredible dreams. Sadly, Maria's gravestone was chipped away by souvenir hunters until there was very little left. Corder's skeleton was on display in a glass case at Suffolk General Hospital. It was apparently rigged with a mechanism that made its arm raised to point to a collection box. Until 2004, Corder's skeleton was on display in the Hunterian Museum in the Royal College of Surgeons, where it hung beside that of Jonathan Wilde, a highwayman. In response to requests from surviving relatives, Corder's bones were removed from display and cremated. The book bound with Corder's skin and his death mask are on display at the Moyes Hall Museum, Bury St Edmunds. Over the years, numerous versions of the story have been told, making it challenging to conduct factual research. However, there are documents available that provide a comprehensive account, including the events that transpired in the courts during that period. Some of these records have been documented by credible witnesses who were present at the time. Thank you for watching.